Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Episode Disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are those of the guest and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, we'll bring you another really awesome guest today uh, involved in creating a better tomorrow for so many people out there. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Devi Sengupta, who is Executive Director of Clinical Development at Gilead Sciences, where she leads the company's HIV cure development program. Uh, and during her time at the company, has led multiple HIV treatment and cure studies and is the head of the HIV cure program. Program. She provides strategic direction uh, for the various cross-functional internal teams and external stakeholders uh, that are involved in developing these really unique combination approaches uh, aimed at achieving long-term HIV remission. Uh, before Gilead, uh, Dr. Sengupta was a physician scientist leading translational HIV immunology research uh, as an assistant professor at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, her NIH-funded program uh, there was focused on identifying novel strategies to enhance cellular immunity against HIV. Uh, she received her bachelor's uh, in psychology and biology at Harvard, her master's uh, in neuropsychology from Cambridge, and her medical degree at the University of Washington School of Medicine, and then completed her internal medicine residency uh, at Johns Hopkins Hospital and Infectious Disease Fellowship at UCSF. A lot of really interesting topics to get into today. We're honored to have her with us. Uh, Dr. Devi Gupta. thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk for a little while. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here um, and uh, can't wait to get into some of the, the questions that you have for me. Um, before we jump in, just um, to make it clear that the, the views that I expressed today are really just my own. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, it's it, it's great having you. Um, you know, I'd love to start off, you know, as we typically do, by by handing you the floor for a little bit, just to, to talk a little bit more about your background. I mean, obviously, being on a, this fascinating journey. Uh, talk about the beginning, a little bit about what got you interested, not just in psychology, biology, neuropsychology, but what put HIV on the map for you? Because when I went into the the peer reviewed literature, it goes back quite a bit to sort of the 2004 year where you start publishing quite early in this process on, on heat shock proteins and HIV. Tell us a little about the early days, if you would, baby. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Ira. You're, you're aging me, but um, I'm excited to uh, tell you a little bit about how uh, my journey started. And, um, and I'm sure we'll kind of get to this, but in some ways of Feel like I've sort of come full circle um, to where where I am today. So um, yeah, so as an undergrad, uh, I decided to pursue my interest in cognitive neuroscience. Um, I was looking at lexical processing, how words are processed, um, and so that was my main focus of of study as an undergrad um, in within the psychology department. Uh, but I during that time, uh, my family is from India, and so. Um, in the summer, sometimes we would go back home to visit extended family. And during one of those summers, um, I had the opportunity to um, do some uh, some work with uh, a non-governmental organization, NGO, called the Child and Need Institute outside of Calcutta. And uh, that was back in 1996, so a very different era um, yeah. compared to where we are today in terms of, of HIV and public health. So during that um, short stint, um, I came into contact with um, with sex workers in rural red light districts. And, you know, really, that was when HIV and uh, 
risk of, of sexually transmitted infections and lack of access to education and um, and medical care kind of was came, you know, I came face to face with that. And so that experience always was sort of in the back of my mind um, as a driver for then wanting to pursue um, a career in medicine, but I still wasn't quite ready to uh, do that at the end of, of college. And so I wanted to dig a little bit more into the neuropsychology uh, work that I had been doing as an undergrad. So I went across the pond to Cambridge and, and did an MPhil um, in neuropsychology. Again, some really cool uh, work in um, Huntington's and Parkinson's disease, um, but then um, eventually went uh, to back to my hometown of Seattle, uh, Washington, to do my uh, MD degree at the University of Washington. And during that time, that's when I kind of uh, fell in love with microbiology and immunology. So that was my uh, kind of I left neuroscience and neuropsychology behind and um, and then decided to take a year out of medical school to do a do a year of research at the bench. Um, and for that, I went across the country to Boston and um, had the good fortune to land in Dr. Bruce Walker's lab um, at the Reagan Institute. And um, and Dr. Walker is still kind of one of the preeminent um uh, leaders in HIV immunology, uh, translational immunology. And, you know, in some ways it was sort of a serendipitous, uh, detour for me. And, you know, I'm sure you probably hear this from many guests. You can never really chart out exactly what your steps are. Yeah. Um, but I ended up there and, um, and that's where I was really bitten by the bug of, okay, how do we understand, um, what, what can we learn from natural HIV infection and natural control of HIV infection? And then eventually how would we potentially apply that to come up with interventions that, uh, that it could improve the lives of people with HIV? Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And this is where, again, you know, I, I so enjoyed sort of uh, going into PubMed and, and looking at sort of your extensive, extensive publication record, but especially this period in your career, because um, as you mentioned you're, you're a translational HIV immunologist. And there were these two really interesting themes, as you were just explaining, um, as you define sort of the cellular correlates of protection from you know, the progression of this disease that you are focusing on at this time, one being this really in interesting interaction between uh, sort of what's going on in the gut microbiome and how it's kind of the interesting T cells, the killer cells and so forth, uh, may be very protective uh, in affection. The other area this, this fascinating domain of um in, in sort of what are referred to these elite controllers of disease about how sort of the uh that unique area of the genome that uh, where a lot of those virus at eight or nine percent of our DNA where those viruses are locked down you know how that is amplified in some of these patients and how they control these talk a little bit about this period of time because I think this is extremely important as we'll get further down the line to what you're doing now and and sort of positioning you about thinking about curing this disease at some point. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, following following medical school, then uh, I was very sure at that point that I wanted to do my residency in internal medicine um, and uh, and I was in Baltimore, uh, treated a lot of people living with HIV and then um, ended up at UCSF. And so during the research years of my fellowship at, at UCSF, um, I was in the lab of, of Dr. Doug Nixon and uh, we pursued a really kind of unusual and I would say non-conventional um, approach to looking at HIV control. And that's exactly what you're referring to as this concept of endogenous retroviruses. Yep. So, you know, it turns out that about, you know, less a little less than 10% of our DNA is composed of these ancient sequences of these so-called fossilized viruses yep. that we were infected with, you know, millions and millions of years ago. And then eventually there was kind of a virus host arms race, and then they became part of our DNA. And And there's a lot of literature out there. I'm no longer an expert in this area, but then uh, the field has moved on. But but it turns out that these endogenous retroviruses actually have um, specific functions, even, for example, in placental formation. So they're, yep. you know, literally kind of inherent and in, in in our in our reproduction and our our existence. So, uh, but what we found was that so normally these are fairly silent viruses. They're just they exist in the form of DNA and they're just silent. They don't have a lot of other 
um, you know, interaction with the immune system. But in people living with HIV, what's really interesting is that the HIV virus itself has kind of a defense mechanism um, that that then kind of uh, deactivates one of the host defenses against viruses Mm -hmm. that then a kind of a bystander effect of that is these endogenous retroviruses can wake up a little bit and start to produce, um, start to be expressed and then thereby stimulate an immune response against them. And then what we, so we found there was some expression of these endogenous retroviruses in people with HIV. And then what we found is that elite controllers, people living with HIV who are able to control the virus naturally to very, very low levels, it turns out that they have particularly strong responses against these endogenous retroviruses and that those those T-cell responses and the, the abbreviation is HERV uh, for human endogenous retroviruses. So these T-cell responses directed against HERVs actually may be somewhat protective and lead to lower viral load. So I guess it's always a little hard to know, you know, what's the chicken and the egg, but we did find an interesting relationship suggesting that these particular T-cell responses actually predict lower viral loads in people living with HIV, lower HIV viral loads. So so the thought was that, you know, could this then be be leveraged for a type of, um, you know, novel vaccine design, for example, to raise up immune responses to these kind of uh, constant and less mutable, less changeable um, uh, sequences, and then use that as a tool against against HIV. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I, I wanted I wanted to highlight that because, you know, as again, we get further into the discussion about sort of the, the breadth of uh, potential, you know, ways to, uh, you know, in 2023 to to further attack and think of different mechanisms, different strategies. I just wanted to sort of lay the groundwork for everything, everything you've been thinking about over the years. That's awesome. Um, so, yeah, I mean, moving forward to um, January of 2021, this major paper in Lancet HIV comes out entitled Multi-Stakeholder Consensus on a Target Product Profile for an HIV Cure. And, you know, you are there amongst other thought leaders from from pharma, from major academic centers, Gates Foundation, major age societies, um, ultimately discussing, you know, what in essence um, is a, is an ideal target product profile for uh, a, a potential curative intervention for uh, for for HIV, and and I think you you know ultimately you settled on these sort of three different classes of therapeutic modalities. Talk about just this paper for a moment and sort of. What what it was like being involved in this? Because clearly, you know, you, you're there representing Gilead, and Gilead has a uh, a strategy here. But you're you're really part of a major group, you know, sort of all coming together uh, and thinking about this from a you know a global perspective. But talk a little bit about what was happening at this particular time. Sure. Yeah. This was, I think, you know, this is one of probably my my most favorite um, initiatives and efforts uh, over the last few years. And um, and it was led, kind of co-led by um, Dr. Sharon Lewin, who's currently the president of the International AIDS Society um, and a professor in Melbourne, and Dr. Steve Deeks, who's a professor at UCSF, and who actually happened to also previously be a mentor of mine when I was at UCSF. So lots of worlds coming together. Um, but this, this target product profile exercise um, was, I think, really unique. Uh, and, and TPPs in drug development, you know, play a really central role because before, you know, even from the earliest stages, when you are thinking about an indication um, and you have an aspirational goal, for example, of HIV cure, it really helps to frame, you know, where where you're trying to go and what the steps may be along the way. Um, because, you know, again, without, without goalposts, you may kind of flounder a little bit. So, but for something like HIV cure, there's no precedent for it. Um, it's really wide open. And so this exercise, as you mentioned, brought together people from many different domains, um, many different different areas, uh, public, private, community, um, regulators, government. And, and that's, that's really that kind of combined effort 
and uh, and brain power and willpower is what it's going to take to get to our ultimate goal. But first, we have to start with it with a TPP, mm-hmm. and um, and so in that in that exercise and that eventual paper, what's outlined is okay. What would be kind of a minimum profile? What would we need to get to to know that we're on the right track? Of course, eventually, what we all would love is um, you know kind of a single shot HIV cure. You take it uh, and you're cured forever. You don't a risk of reinfection. Um, that's kind of like the the moonshot type of uh, type of goal. But for for companies, for regulators, for all all the stakeholders, we need something. You know, sh- we need something kind of short of that to to aim towards. Um, so that as we go through the drug development process and design trials, we know what endpoints to put into the trials. We know, uh, okay, here's an incremental advance, but we're on the right track. So mm-hmm. that so the TPP is is you know broken down into um, the population that we would like the indication, uh, you know which which population would it apply to? Um, what is the minimum level of efficacy? What percentage of people that you give this regimen to? What percentage would need to respond for it to really be a meaningful advance? And for how long? Um, you know, uh, the word cure um, implies that this is something that's kind of a forever cure. But uh, but where we are today in the HIV field is that we may uh, get to more of a type of a remission where people are able to stay off of their lifelong antiretrovirals for a meaningful period of time, mm-hmm. and then we improve on that to get to the true um, the true cure. And so, what is that meaningful period of time? Um, and then very importantly, another dimension of the, the TPP is the safety, because current HIV treatments, we've come so far from where we were, you know, as we were yeah. just talking about in 1996, we've made huge strides. The field has has come a long, long way. So the bar is really high for uh, any novel HIV treatment or or cure or, uh, or anything else. So... Uh, but we also know that some of the uh, modalities that are being tested right now for cure do come along with um, adverse effects. So what's what's tolerable and mm-hmm. what's a no-go? Mm-hmm. Um, so those are the kinds of things that, um, that the TPP outlines. And again, because this particular one was, was a multi-stakeholder um, consensus profile, um, there was a lot of back and forth discussion, lots of very early morning calls across multiple time zones <laughs> around the world, um, and many kind of steps and stages of uh, getting thought leaders together, going back um, and doing surveys. Um, and again, I think just to emphasize again that one of the most important, if not the most important stakeholder in this whole exercise and in this field is really the community because mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's why we're doing this is because yeah. the community of people living with HIV and um, allies and advocates, you know, tell us that this is really an unmet need. We've come a long way in HIV um, since the early days, but this is still um, a huge unmet need. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah no, that's, that's, um, it must have been, actually it must have been a fascinating uh, exercise to to put all this together. Um, again, you know, basically what came out of the exercise is really sort of three baskets, and and, and you know two of them involved sort of the autologous cell transfusions and ex vivo genetic engineering approaches. You know, we profiled um, the, the the city of Hope, the patient number four, you know, CCR five Delta, and all that. Very interesting cases, but probably not, you know, the, the target product profile you want for millions of people out there. Then there was the third basket, which is basically curative therapies utilizing combinations of emerging non-traditional antiretroviral approaches, um, which is, I think, you know, pretty much where where you're focusing um, and then sort of breaking that down, because I know you've been presenting on some of this at some of the conferences recently, mm-hmm. uh, sort of the uh, neutralizing antibodies, immune modulation, and then vaccines. Uh, Talk a little bit about this basket, if you would, because, you know, clearly, um, you know, Mopoli was on the show um, a couple months ago talking about in terms of prophylaxis and, and some novel combinations of existing stuff. 
you're going a little beyond that now and looking at interesting mechanisms, maybe even mechanisms that might not directly kill, but may stimulate latent virus to, to, to destroy certain cells. Talk a little bit about sort of that portfolio within the portfolio that was described in the paper, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, and yeah, we, Mopoli um, and some of my other colleagues also on the treatment side, she, she leads prevention. We also have a treatment program. Um, are working on some really, you know, hopefully game-changing, long-acting antiviral approaches. Um, and so, and again, that will then further, you know, raise the bar for for, for curative approaches. But um, we, the, the strategy that we're um, studying now for, for cure or remission is based on a very strong foundation of preclinical data in the non-human primate model. Um, and we've We've done this work with um, academic collaborators and other collaborators as well. And what that body of work has shown is that if you uh, take uh, monkeys infected with the monkey strain of, of HIV and then suppressed on antiretrovirals, if you have that population uh, of animals and then you give them a combination of an immune modulator, uh, for example, a, a toll-like receptor agonist that basically uh, kind of stimulates the host's antiviral um, innate immune system. So that's one modality, um, immune modulators. You combine that with broadly neutralizing antibodies um, that are directed towards, specifically towards HIV, um, and then also a therapeutic vaccine mm -hmm. that, um, that stimulates the, in this case, the animal's T cells against the, the vaccine insert, which would be directed against, you know, SIV or, or HIV. So those three different modalities, immune modulator, antibody, and vaccine, um, appear to uh, to achieve high rates of, of ART-free remission or ART-free viral control in these animals. So you give them those agents, and then you stop the antiretrovirals, and you follow them for viral rebound. Um, and that combination, we've tested monotherapy, we've tested dual therapy, uh, we've tested triple therapy in, in these animals, and the triple, uh, maybe not surprisingly, kind of does the best out of all of those. And so it's a combination of direct antiviral agents in mm -hmm. the form of the BNAB, and then, but then the other two modalities, the toll-like receptor agonist and the vaccine, are actually host-directed. So they're really boosting the, the body's own ability to, uh, to mount a response against the virus. So that's the kind of the preclinical um, body of work. And, um, and so we've taken that, that took a long time. I'm kind of, you know, simplifying decades and years of, of research, but uh, so those were some breakthrough um, papers that were published and by our, our research group. And what we've done over the last few years since um, over the time that I've been here at Gilead is moved some of these concepts into the clinic. Mm -hmm. Now, once you go to the clinic, first step is, are these safe? We talked, when we were talking sure. about the TPP, we were talking about the, har the high bar for safety. So, you know, as single agents in people living with HIV, do they have an acceptable safety profile? Do they have the right pharmacokinetics? Do they have the right pharmacodynamic activity or biomarker um, activity to then justify moving those single agents into combinations. Um, and so uh, we've made a, quite a lot of progress, I would say, over the last few years. And we're in the stage where dual combinations are um, trials are starting to read out in, in humans. Um, and again, we're seeing some, you know, um, I, I would say incremental, but impactful evidence that, okay, we're on the right track. We need to now do some larger studies, some better powered and mm -hmm. well-controlled trials um, in people living with HIV um, to get some more definitive answers on what combination, uh, what population, you know, what, what combination of agents in what population is going to take us to the next level. It's interesting because you know when you mentioned and, and, and clearly sort of the combination um strategy has 
you know, has transformed this disease um, going back, obviously, to when it, it was considered a death sentence in the 90s to where we are now. And and, and again, the strategy of, of starting off with these interesting combinations. Um, yeah, I brought that up with Mobley, actually, too. And I'd just love to get your thoughts on it, because it seems like, you know, aside from HIV, maybe in, in, in certain cancers, um, we, we, we still as an industry are kind of single magic bullet focused. Um any, any interesting insights there in terms of just the, the combination theme? We haven't talked about HIV for I, just, I know we're, we're, we're skipping aside for a moment here, but any interesting learnings as both a researcher and a clinician as you are uh, in, in sort of combinations for, for other chronic degenerative diseases? Because it seems like we don't, the FDA did come out with some interesting guidance, you know, the last couple of years on how to start earlier with the combinations as opposed to waiting years uh, for the individual drugs to be developed and then combining them. But any interesting personal insights on that as you've been practicing uh, both research and, and clinical medicine? Yeah, I mean, I can, you know, I think you've you've described some of the the evolution in, in the field of medicine overall. And um, and I think, you know, specifically even for HIV cure, I see a lot of overlap with um with onco- oncology approaches. Um, and so, you know, immune modulation, therapeutic vaccination, a lot of these these concepts we're we're borrowing. It's a very different population and a diff- very different risk benefit profile mm-hmm. um, that we have to take into account. But um, but I think there's a lot of you know, learning to be had across these different therapeutic areas. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think the regulators perspective on this and how to safely and, and efficiently move these, these regimens forward. Um, again, I think in, a, you know, particularly in these types of indications where maybe we haven't had as much success. So there, again, there's an unmet need, but we have to take these risk benefit profiles into account. It's that's you're you're kind of hitting on um, you know one of our challenges and, and opportunities. Um, and I and I think you know the way one of the ways we're um, hoping to get at that is through novel clinical trial design. And yeah. um, you know we may come back to that. But uh, and I you probably talked a little bit about that that with Mobley as well in in the context of of prevention, but. Yeah. But I think just globally, um, the, we're in an era now where we have we're testing new mo- modalities, we're testing biologics, um, we are testing combinations, and so the trial design um, has to kind of keep up with with these changes as well. What other area that um, I found fascinating in in, in your publications. Um, Obviously, you know you, you're working on you know directly on the disease, but at the same time, you've you've published a lot on sort of the sequela uh, of HIV, particularly uh, on this theme of uh, immune exhaustion or immunosenescence. Uh, you have one paper looking at HIV in, in infected children, and then another paper, interesting, on um, uh, immunological aging and chronic HIV infection, looking at sort of sen- certain immunosenescence uh, markers and so forth. And again, this gets you. To the point of okay, we we have HIV, but we also have sort of all this other comorbidity associated with it. Um, any interesting learnings there of what you've seen uh, in your own research, whether we're talking about adolescents or the elderly? Uh, because you know the, the whole theme of aging, senescence in general, is kind of hot lately the last couple of years, and it seems to mean uh, that some of what you've been studying, especially the immune system, is a major piece of this. Any interesting insights there per some of the work you did in that area? Yeah, I there I think there's a lot of kind of intersections in um in those themes. So the work you're referring to um dates back a while. So that was again when I was back at, at UCSF and we were studying um one particular marker and there are many um of immunological aging or immune exhaustion. Yep. And um, and there are many, there's a, a huge body of work um, on this uh, from a lot of people around the world. But what it seems that, so HIV, we know that the HIV virus itself and chronic HIV infection, especially when it's untreated, 
um, because there's this constant viral replication and stimulation of the immune system mm -hmm. that can lead to basically burnout. The T cells, the immune system um, is sort of in a constantly activated state. So it's you know, constantly reacting to, um, to the virus in the body. And that can lead to, you know, immune exhaustion and relatedly, um, and the infl and constant inflammation and that then can is linked to higher rates of, uh, you know, renal disease, heart disease, liver disease, cancer. And fortunately, in the era of antiretroviral therapy, the rates of that type of inflammation activation have gone down. I mean, when once people start on antiretroviral therapy, those things normalize to st some extent, but they don't completely go away. And um, and I think this this is again another piece of rationale for no matter how good the lifelong antiretroviral therapy gets, um, that may be a, a continu continued gap that there's this low level immune activation and exhaustion um, and maybe less surveillance of the immune system. Um, and so again, this is why if we can come up with novel mechanisms to, um, to address that, to cure HIV, to lower those levels of, of inflammation or shut it down altogether, then that would be a big, you know, that would be a big win. Yeah. I, I, again, if I, I know it was going back to your UCSF work, but I, I again found it interesting, sort of the connection between, and you know, we've we've discussed some of these themes on the show with with other viruses like CMV, even 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 herpes virus, and sort of the the, the chronic uh, disease sequelae there. So I, I appreciate you, yeah. uh, you sharing that uh, that insight as well. Um, <clears throat> you've been um, last couple of months has been kind of active for you in terms of of conferences. You were. Uh, both at the um, uh, the Vaccine Congress uh, 2023 in Washington, and I think more recently, a uh, conference on retrovirus and opportunistic infections, uh, presenting uh, some of this initial data uh, in terms of, as you were mentioning, the combination strategies uh, in these three baskets of the portfolio. What's, you know, What's happening out on the the scene right now in terms of uh, about the vaccine and the sort of the neutralizing cure um, uh, environment? Because uh, clearly you're out there presenting research on the cutting edge. Um, what what are things like nowadays? Is it at these conferences when people talk about uh, topics like cure? I mean, <laughs> we don't hear that word a lot, but yeah. <laughs> what, what's your what, what's been going on the last couple of months as you've been out there on the road talking yeah. about this data? Um, yeah, it's been an exciting, um, you know, start to 2023. I guess we're almost in the middle of it by now. But uh, but at the beginning, kind of uh, early in 2023, we had the CROI uh, meeting, as you mentioned, and that really is one of the biggest, um, you know, meetings for, for HIV. It's been going on for many, many years. And this was the first year, I think, since 2019 that it was back in person mm -hmm. um, up in Seattle. And so the you know, just by virtue of that fact, there was a lot of palpable energy, um, some great data coming out of, um, you know, multiple areas of, of HIV. And specifically um, for CURE, uh, we, as, as you just mentioned, um, we and others presented data, clinical data on, on combinations. So, um, you know, one thing to mention is that our CURE program is, is one that's done in close partnership with many different um, entities. So other companies, uh, academics, uh, government, um, and then of, of course, uh, community as well. And so during this CORE conference, we had a number of, we and our collaborators had a number of, of presentations. Um, and there were um, preclinical and clinical presentations actually uh, showing that combinations. So for example, in the preclinical space, combinations of a vaccine with different immune modulators could really, you know, produce uh, a huge T cell response. Um, and, you know, hopefully that would have someday translate them to efficacy in terms of viral control. That would, that needs to be proven still, but with, with a novel vaccine modality plus different immune modulators. So that was a nice uh, presentation. And then um, I won't try to go into all of them, but uh, but there was a clinical study, also of a therapeutic vaccine and an immune modulator, 
and then another clinical study of, of two broad neutralizing antibodies and an immune modulator. So you can kind of, and then finally, I think a triple combination, a small triple combination study, putting all three um, modalities together. So, you know, without getting into all the details, I think what we're learning from, from these types of preclinical and clinical studies is, okay, what are the, uh, you know, we're not at a place where we're getting, you know, home runs yet, but uh, but what are the the signals that we can pick up and what are the clues, what are the correlates that we can then build on? Um, mm-hmm. And as we move into larger trials, um, this also helps us to know what what we should be measuring mm-hmm. um, and and again, how how to refine the population. So yeah, Croy was, I think from from an HIV cure cure perspective, really, um, a pretty you know landmark conference this year. Um, just the amount of of uh, cure data um, out there, um, including from us and our, our collaborators, was was great. It was a lot of and it was just a lot of fun to be together. You know, at the poster session, kind of looking at posters, c- reconnecting with people, um, asking all the hard questions, mm-hmm. being being asked all the hard questions, and really just pushing. I think that's that's one of the key things in a in a in the area that's still so early is making sure we're all sort of challenging each other to to th- think really hard about what the next innovation is going to be mm-hmm. um and also you know how to make that innovation meaningful and something that the the community actually wants mm-hmm. yeah um and the vaccine the DC uh, World Vaccine Congress uh, was kind of an entirely different flavor of of conference than than anything I've been to before. This is the first time that um, that I've been uh, in attendance, and I was invited to be on a panel um, it, as part of the HIV workshop. And um, it was it was a fantastic meeting. It's a very I would say um, broad meeting, as the name suggests, World Vaccine Congress. And so HIV was one part of it, but there was of course also a lot of focus on other. Um, viral diseases such as as COVID, but um, the and the the attendees and the um, the opportunities to interact with different people were it was it was nice to also like as much as I love Croy and how focused it is on HIV, it's also once in a while nice to take a step back and see okay what can we learn from uh, people in in other therapeutic areas and the experience uh, from COVID vaccine development and lessons learned. Yeah. Um, from that, as we you know prepare for a long term, longer term view on on an, implementing an HIV cure, and um, and the thing that I really especially enjoyed about the panel was uh, was that it was a mix of uh, people from um, there was someone from IAB, from Gates, um, a couple of people from different universities, and that's exactly you know what we what we need is to have that kind of multidisciplinary conversation so that the silos can be broken down and those you know just serving on a panel with uh with some of these folks has then led to subsequent subsequent conversations about okay let's let's see if is there an avenue for collaboration um Mm -hmm. what can we learn uh from each other and also what can be what are what learnings are there between prophylactic vaccines and therapeutic vaccines Mm -hmm. the latter of which is what we're we're focused on. Yeah. Okay. It's you'll be thinking the um you know a couple of weeks ago um I had uh, Ambassador uh, the King of Song on the show uh, talking you know the 20th anniversary of PEPFAR um and and clearly here is a a moonshot you know, sort of an era of moonshots that are being planned nowadays here's a moonshot that came 20 years ago 100 billion dollars in and it's pretty well pretty well spent uh and made amazing progress um what i mean I, I don't know if you had a chance to sort of watch him in front of congress and and everything that's going on right now in terms of uh it getting renewed and moving forward again with with the uh a 2023 perspective but uh, any thoughts on sort of what you'd like to see with some of these uh hiv moonshot type initiatives uh because you know I, again you are interacting as you were mentioning with the gates foundation with iavi um and, and this hiv thing is uh you know it, it's a it's a global issue different uh different corners of the earth different dealing different components of it but nonetheless um just you know I'd love to have your thoughts on at the 20th anniversary of pepfar uh your perspective sort of on the global health story and 
where yeah. you would like to see, think, see things go. No, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, we cannot kind of underestimate the, the impact of, of those types of, of initiatives. And as we, we move forward, you know, the, the goal is to not lose any ground on, on the progress that's been made and also build on, on, you know, all the years of, of progress. Um, I think, you know, one thing that just, that just calls to mind also, um, and again, I know I'm sort of focused through the lens of, of HIV cure, but Mm -hmm. one thing that we've tried to do is, uh, sort of change or, um, at least affect the model or, or, uh, test the model, the kind of traditional model of, um, doing a lot of the early drug development in one part of the world and then rolling it out, um, into other parts of the world, uh, low income settings, for example, after, you know, at a much later stage. And, uh, so one of the, uh, projects and trials that I'm really excited about and, and proud of is, um, it's a small but mighty, I would like to say, uh, cure trial that we're doing in South Africa, um, mm-hmm. in in Durban, and uh, this is in you know really close collaboration with um, academics on the ground and again community on the ground um, in a population of young women who um, were infected with HIV but who were able to start antiretroviral therapy very early in the course of infection. So a very, uh, you know, a, a unique population from a scientific perspective. And then of course, also from just a global health perspective, there are very few trials that are um, done in, in an all women population, let alone in, in sub-Saharan Africa, but yet that's one of the, you know, areas of most unmet need. So um, we will, you know, learn what we can from, from that trial, both in terms of the science and also, um, you know, how we can do these kind of complex and intensive trials in different settings. So I would just say that, you know, as these different organizations, you know, these these types of, of trials and projects and initiatives, again, can't really be done in a vacuum. So the more that, that your private sector can work with the public sector and with global health experts, you know, that will just... I think accelerate the the pace of, of progress and and make sure that nobody's left behind. Awesome message, really awesome message. Um, Davy, one one last thing while I have you, um, you know, when when one Google's your name, aside from everything HIV and immunology coming up, um, a couple of articles also come up that aside from an awesome. HIV immunologist, you were also some type of singer. Uh, <laughs> there, there's several there's several articles from the Harvard Crimson going back to the mid '90s uh, that uh, about you singing uh, traditional Urdu and Bengali songs. And, and the interesting thing here, when I was reading these articles, um, I had Dr. Uh, Azra Raza on from Columbia, who heads the uh, the Milo Dysplastic Syndrome Center there. And you know, aside from thinking about bloodborne cancers, uh, she wrote a book actually about uh, uh, a series I'm pronouncing this the Ghazal, Ghazals, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, the, the stories of of unrequited love uh I'm just wondering you know do, do you get any time to sing and perform anymore or in your spare time when you're not thinking about HIV that is it's so funny that you're asking me this I feel like it's almost like a planted question except that I know that it's not because um <laughs> yes I so I I I have this strong musical interest. I'm a singer um, of something I did kind of early in life and um, and then got very busy with other things like education, work, parenting, all these things. But um, I'm really excited because just this last weekend, so just a few days ago, um, I was able to perform with, uh, with a band of fellow musicians um, here in San Francisco. And um, the... The wonderful thing about this uh, this band is that it's it brings together a few different musical styles and influences. So um, we have these amazing musicians from Spain who mm-hmm. are flamenco and gypsy jazz, Spanish gypsy jazz mm-hmm. um, experts, guitar, percussion, um, and then we have uh, Indian percussion, um, piano, saro, blah blah bass. So, uh, so I'm getting back into it. Is the short answer and um, and it's yeah, it's been a lot of fun to to revisit that part of of my life as well. And um, 
And actually we did, uh, I was able to kind of bring the two worlds together. So in the beginning of 2020, or in 2020, um, our band was supposed to perform at the International Aid Society meeting um, okay. that summer. But you know what happened in March of 2020. And sure. so we we kind of adjusted and put together an outdoor recording in somebody's backyard <laughs> and put together a video and shared that um, online with the Global Village at the, the IAS meeting. So that's awesome. Um, yes, music is is the universal language. So I'm uh, hoping to share share more of it moving forward. But thank you for asking. That's awesome. No, that's really I I said I I, I tried to dive into everything uh baby send Gupta and, and those papers just were fascinating to me as well, <laughs> separate from the HIV theme. So thank you for sharing that as well. Yes, and hopefully you can, you can, you know, see you see you perform online at some point. Uh um yeah, really, really awesome stuff, baby. I I just um it's just an impressive journey that you've been on, uh such a an impressive uh, portfolio that you have in front of you now and just really wishing you uh, and your team the best with all of it as we, we enter this new era. Um, again, for everybody uh, that's going to be listening to this particular uh, episode of the show across the various podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel. Again, you've been listening to Dr. Devi Sengupta, Executive Director, Clinical Development, Gilead Sciences, leading their company's HIV cure development program. Uh, Devi, I, I want to thank you again for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us and educate us for a little while. Obviously, thank you for everything you're doing there. And, and as we like to say on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow via what you do. Really great story. And really, thanks for sharing it. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful to talk to you. And I'm really excited to be able to share some of the work that we're doing. Great, Abby.